Come on, you VB jackoff. Write some C for me. Let me see it. Here. I'll make it easy for you. You can make it not so easy. Sure thing. Son of a... Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS on Windows 95 days. And I've been coding in C and C++ for about 40 years. Today, I'm going to show you a construct that can increase your code speed by a factor of 1,000 in some cases, complete with actual working examples. It's all thanks to a keyword that you might have underestimated, const expression. Now, if you thought that this was just a more formal C++ way of defining a constant, you couldn't be more mistaken because it goes way beyond that. This really came about in C++14, and I tend to view a lot of the new stuff that comes in C++ as kind of esoteric, but this is really handy. So what the const expression keyword really means is that whatever you're declaring can be entirely figured out at compile time. But for anything more than simple expressions, it can be very constraining because you can't assign anything to a const expression that cannot also be determined at compile time. As a result, a lot of C++ programmers just wind up using it as a way of avoiding pound defines like this. Now, that's all well and good, and it's type safe in a way that a pound define would not be, but did you realize that you could also write that as a const expression function? At its most basic, you would write it as follows. We simply declare a function as const expression, and whatever you do in the function will be evaluated at compile time. It would be a lot more interesting if we could pass the height in as an argument, though, rather than hard coding everything. So let's see if we can do that. We won't change anything else except to make the height an argument, and then we'll pass the matrix height in from main. Note that the value of matrix height is pound defined, and so it's known at compile time. And so even with an argument, it means the compiler can entirely evaluate the entire function at compile time. In fact, if we get a little hardcore for a second and look at the assembly code that gets generated, there's no call ever made to half height or any function at all. The whole function was evaluated at compile time, executed by the compiler internally, and the result of 16, or 10 hex, takes its place. So that entire function collapses down to a single move instruction. Now that's impressive, but I'd wager that the standard optimizer all by itself could have done that by inlining the code, evaluating the expression, replacing the result of that evaluation. But that's only because this first example was so basic. So what if we wanted to do something non-trivial, something that contains branches, conditionals, or even recursion? Can we build a real algorithm that does actual useful work in a const expression function? The answer is yes, and it can work so well that it's what prompted me to actually make this episode. So let's tackle a more complicated problem that meets those criteria, like finding the Fibonacci sum for a given integer. To refresh your memory of school was a while ago now, the Fibonacci sequence is just a numeric sequence where each number is the sum of the two preceding ones. You always start the series with 0 and 1, and that makes the next number the sum of 0 and 1, and hence 1. So the next number is the sum of the last two, or 1 and 1, and so 2. And then the next number is 2 and 1, so 3, and then 5 and 8, 13, 21, and so on. Let's take a look at my C version. The first thing we do is check whether the number is 1 or 0. If it's 0, we return 0, and if it's 1, we return 1. We do that by just returning the number itself whenever it's less than or equal to 1. That's our anchor case for the recursion. In all other cases, we must call back into ourselves recursively to get the two prior Fibonacci numbers. At first, this might feel like it's turtles all the way down, but remember, it will eventually hit the 1 or 0 case. So the function will call itself over and over until it gets down to the Fibonacci number for 1, which returns a value of 1, and everything else cascades back up the stack, being added up and returned at the end of the steps. Now this problem is fun to work with, especially for first year computer science instructors, because it's easily written using recursion. But recursion is actually an incredibly expensive way to solve it. And that's because it's computationally explosive. Each call to Fibonacci requires not one, but two calls to itself. And those will in turn need two calls, and so on, and so on. And so on, and so on, and so on. Consider the case of finding the Fibonacci number for 5. It has to call to get the answer for 4 and 3, and 4 in turn has to call and get the answer for 3 and 2, and 3 needs the answer for 2 and 1. Then going back up the tree to finish where we left off, the Fibonacci number for 3 again needs the answers for 2 and 1. And this is all just to a depth of 5. For a call depth of 35, the tree grows exponentially, and if my math is right, 
it would mean that there are about 29,860, 703 nodes in that tree. That's a lot of stack usage. Now, you might be tempted to optimize this solution, having noted that the algorithm winds up repeating parts of the tree, like when it asks for the Fibonacci number for four two different times. You could cache each result the first time it was generated, right? And that would help a lot. And my response is, quit it. If we learned anything from the movie Christine, it's that you can't polish a turd, and this algorithm is no exception. If you've really got to solve Fibonacci for some reason, do it linearly and iteratively, not recursively. For all you nerds out there, the recursive solution to Fibonacci has a complexity on the order of 2 to the nth power. Nerd! Spoiler alert, even so, modern computers are very fast. On my PC, it can calculate this about 25 times per second. But that still could be an eternity if it's inside some important loop, so let's see if we can improve on that by writing it with const expression. To keep the comparison fair, we won't improve or change the algorithm at all, only the code itself. We'll let the compiler do the heavy lifting, and it can transform our code from order 2 to the nth power all the way down to first order complexity. For you non-nerds, that means that you'll get the answer immediately, no matter what you ask for. Sound like magic? Well, let's see it in action. I'll duplicate the function and just add underscore c to the end so that I can keep it in the file alongside the original. And other than the renaming, it turns out that the only change I have to make is to add const expression to the declaration. Before we dive into the implications of that for the compiler, let's check the performance. And it turns out that our execution time drops from 40 milliseconds to 40 microseconds. Or more accurately, 38 microseconds. That's more than 1,000 times faster, or three orders of magnitude. And full disclosure, most of that time was probably spent reading the clock because just like our simple matrix site function, the compiler can collapse the entire recursive logic chain down to a value and replace it entirely with the result. So the Fibonacci sum for the number 35 is 9,227,465. But when marked with const expression, there's no code omitted to solve it. The compiler figures out the answer from your logic at compile time and simply hard codes the result in line. Let's take a walk through the code together so we can see how that's possible. We can see that result underscore c is going to hold the result of the Fibonacci sum, which is calculated by passing num to the Fibonacci function. Num itself is also a const expression being set to 35. So far so good, no ambiguity. When our Fibonacci function is called for any number 2 or larger, it's going to have to call itself twice. Let's look at the requirements for recursive const expression functions and how they are evaluated at compile time to see what their inputs must be. First, the arguments of a const expression function must be a literal type, like int or care, and it means they must have a value that can be determined at compile time. Second, every recursive function, including Fibonacci, needs a base case that stops the recursion. For compile time evaluation, this base case must also be something that can be determined at compile time. Behind the scenes, the compiler is going to effectively execute your code as it reads it in, and if the recursion never stops, the compiler would either just run out of memory or never return. When a const expression function is called with literal arguments, the compiler attempts to evaluate the function at compile time. In the case of a recursive const expression function like Fibonacci, the compiler unfolds each recursive call into its respective expressions until it hits the base case. Since all these operations are performed at compile time on well-known values, the compiler is still able to evaluate them entirely during compilation. Modern compilers, including the CLang compiler that I'm using behind the scenes here, are equipped with advanced optimization techniques. They can detect patterns, simplify expressions, and perform optimizations that make compile time evaluation of even complex recursive functions feasible. And of course, there are still some practical limitations to the complexity of const expression functions that can be evaluated at compile time, dictated by the compiler's capabilities and the compilation environment's resources like memory and CPU. Compilers may impose limits on recursion depth or the number of const expression evaluations and so on to prevent compile time operations from consuming excessive resources. Speaking of those limitations, as I noted earlier, Evaluating the expression tree for the Fibonacci sum of 35 involves about 30 million nodes. To get that code to compile, I wound up setting two compiler options, which I'll put in the video description, to custom values. Basically, I pushed the max values for the const expression evaluation steps and the tree depth up to some large value so that it would try its hardest as it could until it ran out of memory or finished the job, or I got bored of waiting and killed it off. And I might as well confess that the selection of 35 was not entirely arbitrary. It's a value that finishes compiling on a non-geological timescale, and it takes some 40,000 microseconds when performed computationally, so it was a decent balance point while I was experimenting. 
I sense that some of you may not still be convinced and that my order one solution for Fibonacci might be perceived as somehow a contrived case. But it's so simple. So what if we undertook a much more complicated problem like the Civ of Aristosthenes for solving primes? And not for just some small fixed set like 100, but let's say the primes up to say 10 million. Because coincidentally, that's what it takes to compete in the language drag racing series here in Dave's Garage. A couple of years ago, I wrote a prime sieve in C++, C Sharp, and Python to compare their runtime performance. That grew into the language drag racing series, and thanks to the dedicated work of folks like Rutger and Tudor, not to mention all the developers who have contributed solutions along the way, and it has exploded to about 100 languages in total. If you want to see more on how such languages compare, make sure you're subscribed to my channel. The example we're going to look at next is a C++ exhibition competitor in the language racing series, but it's largely a faithful implementation of my original sieve solution from way back when. The only difference is that it defines the size of the sieve at compile time, whereas competitors in the series must accept the sieve size as a runtime argument. Now, a runtime size would prevent the whole const expression approach from being possible, so we allow it here, but as a result, its score doesn't count in the official competition. As a reminder of how a prime sieve is implemented, the basic idea is to imagine that you had a set of 100 boxes all in a row, corresponding to the numbers from 1 to 100. Each box can in turn contain true or false, and they all start off as true. How do you carve an elephant? Well, you just get a big stone and carve away everything that doesn't look like an elephant. And to find the primes, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to cross off all the boxes that aren't prime numbers because we know them to be multiples of other factors. So we do that by crossing off all the multiples of 2 and 3 and 5 and so on until all that remain are the prime numbers by virtue of the fact that they never got crossed off by any of the multiples. So to get things started, we cross off 1 as non-prime by definition. To run the algorithm, all we do is repeat these following steps. We find the next box that has not been cleared. It will be a prime number, and in this case, it's the box for the number 2. We then walk through the boxes and set every subsequent multiple of 2 to be false. That means that after crossing off all the multiples of 2, we pick the next remaining number, which is 3. And then we cross off all higher multiples of 3. To get our next number, we go to box 4, but it was set to false back when we did the multiples of 2, so we skip it. And we move on to find the next box that's available as being 5. And so we do all the multiples of 5, and then 7. We skip 9 since it was set to false when we did the multiples of 3. We repeat that process until we get up to the square root of 100, which is 10 and was crossed off by 2 and 5, so we're already done. After those steps are complete, the only boxes still left in the civ list marked as true represent the prime numbers that survive the gauntlet. That's the theory. The question is whether we can implement that logic that performs all that work in a const expression function. And my instinct would have been 100% to say no way until I actually saw it done in the Dave's Garage language racing series as a C++ competitor, solution number three, contributed by Florian Lloyd Putcher. Or at least that's how we pronounce it here in Sammamish. I hope it's not too far off. It's a genius solution, so let's have a look at the code that does it. Everything is implemented nice and tidy in a civ class, and execution begins with the const expression function called runciv. Its first challenge is going to be to calculate a square root as a const expression because you can't call the regular square root function in the standard library as it is not const expression. Fortunately, a const expression version of square root is provided up at the top of the file. Now, I could probably do an entire episode on this square root function alone, but that will have to wait for another day. The actual civ memory is just a local member variable, not a heap allocation, meaning its size is also known at compile time, which is important for reasons that should be apparent by now. In the heart of the code, other than the looping, the run civ code only makes two calls. One to check if a box is true or false with a function called contains, and one called remove to mark that box as false. These member functions can be written as const expression functions because they refer only to the static civ allocation and nothing else. And so every part of this code is const expression, meaning the compiler can completely evaluate it at compile time. Now, as incredible as that may sound, it works. It does take a few minutes to compile since the compiler is doing all the legwork of populating the civ bits and then counting them for you. The count function itself is const expression as well, meaning that when you create a civ and call run civ and count, they can be entirely computed at compile time and the result is used in place of the call. That has the effect of producing instant results, even for prime numbers. I first became aware of this code when I noticed that it was so fast and ran so many iterations in the 5 second test window that the count of passes overflowed a 32 bit integer and wrapped around to negative. When I was debugging to figure out why that was, I determined that it was because the code executed instantly with no delay. 
So this is all probably fairly new to you, and with all this in mind, let me know in the comments what other applications you can find for this approach. I'd be very curious to hear about any wins you can get by taking advantage of cost expression. It might mean fundamentally rethinking some of your most important low-level calls, but the rewards can be enormous. If you've found today's episode to be any combination of interesting or informative, remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. And if you or someone you know may be on the autism spectrum, check out the free sample of my book on Amazon. It's everything I know about living your best life on the spectrum. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.